be here to celebrate Pat's birthday. I hope you realize this is the Turing centenary. Now 90 is pretty close to 100. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Turing tragically died at a very early age, and it's so wonderful to have such a big turnout here to celebrate Pat. And just think, in 2022, what a big turnout it's going to be. <laughs> Pat was much too kind in his remarks uh, the first day. I do want to tell him how much I've appreciated his support, mentoring, inspiration over the years. It's meant such a tremendous thing uh, to me, Pat. And uh, I'm glad that I'm the second oldest colleague. Uh, Kenneth Harrow gets the prize of the oldest one from 1950. No, that's but, not true. Sorry? It's not true. What's the other one? Myself, Ted Anderson. Ted Anderson, when are you from? 1993. I'm sorry, I'm 93. I'm a professor emeritus at Stanford University. Oh, great. Okay, well, I'm, I'm the third then. <laughs> I was thinking back on some personal history when I entered the University of California as a freshman in 1950, what seems like an awfully long time ago to me. I looked up on the internet and found that the population of California was 10 and a half million people. Today, the population of California is 37 and a half million people, bigger than all of Canada. And I realize if I were magically made a high school student again, I would never have been able to get into the University of California under present circumstances. It's amazing how things have changed. I wouldn't be able to afford the University of California either. <laughs> right. But it changed my life. Meeting Pat changed my life. Going to Princeton totally changed my life. And I certainly appreciate all those uh, opportunities. <coughs> Just a couple of days ago, maybe a little bit longer, I came upon a letter. You won't be able to read this. Uh, Thing here in the notices of the American Mathematical Society. Let me quickly respond to it. Someone was answering uh, an article written by Frank Quinn, A Revolution in Mathematics. And he says, my mathematics colleagues almost never think about mathematical logic. See the uh, paper by Davis and Hirsch for a funny and profound description of mathematicians. Oh dear. Ruben Hirsch's book, What is Mathematics Really, is one of the most irritating books on my, <laughs> on my shelves. <laughs> Mathematical logic is almost never taught in mathematics departments, this chap says. He's David Edwards. He's an emeritus professor at the University of Georgia. I looked him up. That's a rather interesting uh, CV there. Logic is almost never taught in mathematics department. It's taught in computer science departments and philosophy departments, and when it is, it is taught in a purely technical way with no concern for history or philosophy, except at Stanford, except at Berkeley, except at Harvard. I mean, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> now, in reference to what Harvey was saying, mathematicians still live in Canada's paradise or even Eilenberg's paradise. I think he should have said McLean's paradise there. Mm -hmm. In spite of Russell's paradox, they simply learn not to make certain moves that lead to trouble as long as the referee doesn't complain. What? Me worry? <laughs> the various formalizations for avoiding Russell's paradox also prevent one from making certain moves which are usually safe and powerful. So mathematicians work informally and have always done so. There is almost no trace of mathematical logic in most of the history of modern mathematics. <laughs> oh, my. Who's going to answer this letter in the notices of the American Mathematics? I offer that as a challenge. 
I'm not saying that mathematicians are aware of what I said. Most are totally unaware of these issues and are simply working in a successful research tradition. Pat, if your books are going to be reprinted again soon, maybe you should add something to the preface there about the importance of logic and what it can do for you. What I want to turn here now is a bit of history about uh, Turing, because of this uh, centenary that's uh, taking place. Things happened very quickly. As uh, Jens Eric was saying, Schoolum had a lot of very original results. In fact, Schoolum could have proved the completeness of first order logic. But it wasn't so much in the air. What happened was that uh, Hilbert and Ackerman's book came out and it formulated the questions about completeness and the Entscheidungs problem or decision problem that I want to allude to uh, today. And then Gödel moved so fast and got his proof of the, uh, of the uh, completeness theorem and then the incompleteness theorem. And so Schoolum's uh, uh, things weren't as uh, noticed as they should have been. But things also moved very quickly with uh, Church and uh, Turing. So Church got his degree uh, in uh, 1927, and then he went uh, for two years to Europe first to Göttingen and then to England, I think. And um, he was formulating a new approach to foundations of mathematics, which then was published in uh, 19, what does it say, I read it here, 19, uh, oh no, I didn't put those things on. His, his uh, new approach to uh, foundations was published in 32, I think, the, day I was, the, the year I was born. And uh, one of the things that uh, he did was to take over uh, Frege's ideas of uh, making functions uh, the prominent abstract object in his uh, theory. But uh, in the uh, meantime, uh, influenced by uh, Max Newman, a very, uh, I, I was very glad to have met Newman in uh, England, very lively uh, professor who was one of the only people lecturing on logic at Cambridge. This was long past the uh, time of uh, Russell and Whitehead. And so he introduced uh, Turing to the decision problem in first order logic, and then Turing set about solving it in his way by uh, defining what it means to give a computation that would uh, work on such uh, problems. And so then it turned that out the church's paper was published and received in England, and then Turing realized that he had been anticipated a bit, but things worked out uh, very uh, amicably between <coughs> Church and uh, Turing, even though they had uh, competing ways of uh, approaching the problems. And Turing came for two years to Princeton uh, there. The sad thing is, both uh, Rosser and Claney had finished their PhDs and gone off to their first jobs. And Gödel, who had been earlier in uh, Princeton at the uh, invitation of von Neumann, went back to Austria and then had to escape with the train across St Siberia. Uh, and so he wasn't in Princeton. And so Turing never met Claney, Rosser, and Gödel, which is too bad because they could have had lots of, lots of uh, inter interactions. But uh, both uh, Church with his theory of functions and Turing with his theory of machines uh, then proved each other's versions, gave the same class of computable functions, as you know. And uh, uh, of course, what happened with uh, Church's lambda calculus that he used for his definition of computability, uh, <coughs> plainly found that people didn't really want to hear about it very much, and so he transferred everything over to his way of approaching recursive function theory just on numbers, number theoretic functions, which of course became the, the prime way of, uh, of doing it. Church's solution to the decision problem for first order logic, that is to say, uh, given some axioms in first order logic, can you decide whether, whether some formula is a theorem or not? Uh, Church said, 
let's just write down 